this is the message of James, that we, in our own ability, cannot stand in the face of adversity. We could never find the strength to trust without faith because we don't have the capability to see above the trials that we meet, to keep our eyes focused on the King while counting the situation we are currently experiencing as joy. Faith works. This is the essence of James. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Without faith, without works, we too quickly become that man in the mirror staring at his face, but then forgets the way he looks as soon as he turns away. But with faith, with works, we stay steadfast on this journey, progressively sanctified, knowing we'll be perfected once we reach the other side. Faith works. This is the cry of James, that faith apart from works can never be sustained, that in every day and in every way we should see this truth proclaimed because it's faith that makes us doers of the word, not just hearers. It's faith that keeps us humble, not proud. It's faith that directs our tongues to bless, not to curse. It's faith that causes us to show mercy, not judgment. It's faith that leads us to true religion, not its empty substitute. And it's faith that's causing us to preach the good news to every tribe, tongue, and nation with every breath that we breathe. And it will be faith that causes us to worship our God for all eternity. This is the message of James. Faith works. Amen. And welcome to Impact Church this morning. How is everybody doing? Good. Hope you're excited to be in the house of the Lord and dig into God's word. And the uh, Lord has been uh, giving us tremendous messages through his word, especially in this first chapter of James that we just completed last week. Took us six weeks to get through it, but I hope that the Lord taught you and uh, moved you as much as he has done me. One of, that was my favorite chapter, I believe, in God's word. A lot in there to dig out, and I hope the Lord has used it thoroughly in your life. All right, so we get, we get to start into chapter two here this week, continuing in our sermon series through the book of James uh, called Faith in Action. And we're going to get a message today that is uh, very right up front to uh, things that our society faces and even deals with today outside the church and, yes, even inside the church. And that is a message that comes against division. So the title of today's message is Tearing Down the Walls and Demolishing Division. So before we get started, I just want to say welcome. And I, if you're visiting with us this morning, maybe it's your first time, fifth time, whatever it is, you're searching for a church home, a place to really anchor and get plugged in. We hope the Lord leads you right here. God's doing an amazing, amazing, amazing work. We're just getting started. We would love for you to be a part of what God's doing. If you're looking for a Bible-believing, preaching church, who preaches God's word unapologetically and doesn't sugarcoat or water it down, you're in the right place. We're looking to make disciples, and we believe God's word changes lives, so we're not ashamed to preach it in its raw, unedited form. <laughs> and that's how you will hear God's word every single week here at Impact. So welcome with us this morning. And a lot of ways to get plugged in as well, and we hope you do so. Even life groups, uh, our life group with the Book of John will be back on this Wednesday. And so many ways to get plugged in. So we hope that you would join up, get plugged in as we look to make disciples here in this church. So James chapter 2 is going to get us going on this message, tearing down the walls, demolishing division. And I want to start this message today by reading a story that is very applicable and right on point to what this passage is about today. Pastor Jeremiah Stepik transformed himself into a homeless person and went to the 10,000 member church that he was to be introduced as the head pastor at that morning. He walked around his soon to be church for 30 minutes while it was filling with people for service. Only three people out of the seven to 10,000 people said hello to him. He asked people for change to buy food. No one in the church gave him anything. He went into the sanctuary to sit down in the front of the church and was asked by the ushers if he would please go and sit in the back. He greeted people 
to be greeted back with stares and dirty looks, with people looking down on him and judging him. As he sat in the back of the church, he listened to the church announcements as the service started. When all that was done, the elders went up and were excited to introduce the new pastor of the church to the congregation. We would like to introduce to you Pastor Jeremiah Stepik. And the congregation looked around, clapping with joy and anticipation. The homeless man sitting in the back stood up and started walking down the aisle. The clapping stopped with all eyes on him. He walked up to the altar and took the microphone from the elders who were in on this and knew what was going on and paused for a moment when then he recited, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. After he recited this, he looked towards the congregation and told them all that he had experienced that morning with being shunned away and ignored. Many began to cry and many heads were bowed in shame. Then the pastor said, today I see a gathering of people not a church of Jesus Christ. The world has enough people, but not enough disciples. When will you decide to become a disciple? I say that story to tell us and put it in front of us. I wonder what we would have done this morning had that been the case today. I wonder what we will do tomorrow if that's the case after being confronted with this word of God today? And how will we act? And what will we do to lay aside the walls that society that has built up inside of each and every one of us? Walls of prejudice, walls of partiality, thoughts of discrimination, and ways that if somebody doesn't look like us, dress like us, act like us, live on our same level, that we can't associate with them or be a part of them. Guys, I'm going to tell you today that that is a wall of division that Satan wants to put inside each and every church because let me tell you what it does. It turns somebody away from Jesus that comes to find him. And no greater harm is done to a person than when somebody who claims the name of Jesus turns them away because of society's indwelt prejudice and partiality that we all must deal with. Guys, that's the message in James chapter 2 today. And that's why we all in here don't want to get a condemnation message because praise God, his mercy is renewed every morning. But it's an opportunity to make sure we get this right. It's an opportunity for us to move and be motivated in Jesus, to grab a sledgehammer and tear down the walls and demolish division. Let me pray for us before we dive in. Dear Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, we come to you today to glorify you, Lord, to lift you up, and Lord, to be moved by your presence, Father, and by your word. Lord, I love your word. Lord, it just always shows up and moves at the right time and right where we're at. So, Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty great work in each and every one of us individually. And, Lord, as so, that you would collectively do a work in us as the body of Christ, as part of this body of Christ at Impact Church, where, Lord, we want to do just that. We want to make an impact for you. We want to be game changers for the gospel. We want to build your kingdom and not our own. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us today be moved by your word, that we would lay aside all of society's indwelt 
partiality and prejudices and discrimination and everything that our minds and our hearts have been fed and, and put in front of us for so long. And Lord, that we would cast that out of our hearts, our lives, and it would be cast out of your church. Father, where people could come here and know their value doesn't lie in who they are, but in who Jesus is. So Lord, I pray that you would move through your word. Lord, do what only you can do, and you get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you have a copy of God's Word with you today, turn to the book of James chapter 2. Our passage today will be verses uh, 1 through 13. So we're going to cover a a large uh, portion of this chapter today, roughly uh, half of it. And uh, so we will hear directly a moving word with five points that are really going to be brought out in this passage today. So let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word And let's read verse 1 through 13 together in James chapter 2. It says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You may be seated. Very strong and direct word from James here today to the church. And remember, we're getting the first words from the canon of Scripture to the church at that time as James wrote this first book chronologically of the New Testament. So our first point that we're going to dig out today comes right through the first couple verses. And our first point in this passage is this, is no prejudice or partiality is to be tolerated in the church. No prejudice or partiality is to be tolerated in the church. This is the first step of five of grabbing the sledgehammer to tear down the wall and demolish division. So right here, James, right off the bat, basically starts out with, Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, with partiality. If you have a new King, uh, a King James version of the Bible, it says, um, with respect of persons. And basically that respecter of persons, literally translated, means don't lay hold of a person's face. Well, what does that mean? That means don't judge a person by their appearance. Plain and simple. All right. We know the story and we know the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. But how so often we are guilty of doing that in our society? And yes, even within the church. And that's nothing new because James was dealing with it back then. And to keep in context, and we know who he's preaching to, he's preaching to the, uh, the church as it started who had not had much infiltration of the Gentiles at the time. So as such, he was speaking to the Jews scattered abroad in the 12 tribes. They were persecuted and scattered. Many of which who had persecuted them were 
not Jews, were Gentiles, okay? So that added to their prejudice, their hatred toward a group of people, many of whom were well off and rich and had come against them even in the courts and against their Lord. And so there was easier way for them to be prejudiced towards certain groups or types of people, all right? So these Jews had over time developed prejudices just like each and every one of us have because we've lived in a society where prejudices and partiality is all around us. It's part of the sin nature that we inherited from the fall, that if somebody doesn't look like us, act like us, dress like us, we think they're less than us. And that is not the case with Christ. So the Jews often discriminated against non-Jewish people. James wrote to these people who had a very partial attitude and way of thinking. It was in a partial age filled with many prejudices, his hatred of class, ethnicity, nationality, religious background. In the ancient world, and even just like today, people were routinely and permanently categorized because they were one way or another. They were either Jew or Gentile. They were slave or free. They were rich or poor. You've heard that if you've read the New Testament in its entirety so many times. So a significant aspect of the, the work of Jesus was to do what? Was to come and, and break down the very walls that society had put up to divide people and say that certain people weren't as good as others. And he wanted to tear down that wall, especially within his church, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's what Jesus came to tear down, to start this one race of mankind, if you will, all in Jesus, all unified together of one accord and with one voice. And we see that in the early church in Acts, if you read that. That's what God come to put together. Guys, I want to tell you, man causes division. Man causes division. We're the ones who, who caused even division within the church. We divided by denomination, by Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian. Jesus didn't come to do that stuff. Man did that stuff because of the division that was already in their heart. We further divide it in ways we don't even realize anymore. We segregate ourselves in churches. We have a black church and a white church. What's up with that? We don't value that in our society. We shun that in our society. That's what Dr. Martin Luther King and the whole movement of, of getting rid of segregation was about, that we, we all could, could enjoy a, a same society together. But yet we do that volitionally in the church and divide ourselves why would that be jesus didn't come for us to do that to ourselves jesus wants us all to have unity with him inside the church and with each other and that's why he come to tear down that wall and guys i'm going to tell you today He's given us a sledgehammer where we can break down the wall that society and the enemy wants to use to divide us, but then not only just to divide us, to divide us, but to divide us in such a way that it makes people feel less valued in Christ and they run away from the church and from Jesus. That's the real danger right there. And that's why it must be broken down. And that's why James addresses this even so early in this passage to the church. So we see that unity just doesn't come automatically, does it? It just doesn't. James and the apostles had to teach the early church God's word, God's truth to break down those walls of division. Guys, today, you and I have to be confronted with God's word the same way to break down the walls of prejudice and division that exist in our society and within our hearts, and within our churches. It's God's word that breaks down these walls and sets us free and allows, allows the light of Christ to shine like it's supposed to. So the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ should never be associated with partiality. And I mean, the, let's be honest. I mean, we judge a lot of things by their appearance, don't we? 
And I mean, some of that's okay because of our preferences, because of our, our styles or whatever. I, I judge what, what type of car or, or vehicle I like and want to drive, and so do you, and that's okay. I judge uh, what, what type of house I, I feel is, is uh, cool looking or whatever, and then that's okay. I judge what kind of clothes that, that I want to wear and what kind of clothes you want to wear, and where there's difference in preferences, that's okay. I judge what type of food that I find appealing by its appearance on a plate. And so do you. And that's okay. But guys, what is never okay is when you and I judge by appearance a person and judge their value and their worth to us and more importantly, their worth to Jesus and their value as a part of a body of Christ by what they look like and by who they are. So we've got to break down this wall. What are and what is the danger of these thoughts? We've talked about this so many times in various different ways. We just talked about this in chapter one, is what gets in our mind, guys, goes where? (laughs) Gets in our heart. And what's in our heart eventually does what? It comes out in our actions. So therefore, the beginning to win this battle starts where? In our mind that we have to allow the Lord to cancel out these thoughts of prejudice, these thoughts of partiality. Because if we're not careful, these thoughts of partiality and prejudice will become acts of partiality and prejudice. And when they come out as acts, they come out as acts of discrimination, and it runs people away from Jesus. It makes people feel less important and not needed. This can be done in economic status, as we see here in James. It can be done with race. It can be done by the way somebody's dressed. It can be done by the way they look. Because what are some other, what are some acts of, of, uh, I just lost my train of thought here. (laughs) What are some acts of partiality and prejudice, if we're not careful? Flattery and gossip. You know what those are. Flattery is what you say to somebody's face that you won't say behind their back. When you just want to kiss up or you really have ulterior motives about who they are or whatnot, but you, you say to somebody's face what you are not saying behind their back. That's flattery. And then we know what gossip is. Gossip is when you say behind somebody's back what you won't say to their face. Guys, both are sin. Both are sin. Did you ever think about it that way? That it's sin. You see, you and I, we're so, we're so good at this because of our human nature. We try, to, we try to make ourselves feel more righteous by comparing ourselves to somebody else. And if we don't feel like we sin as bad as somebody else does, that we're more righteous than them. Guys, that's scary, but it happens a lot. I've been guilty of it. Have you? Guys, we can't do that. We need to look at our own sin. And if we're in the sin of, yes, gossip or the sin of even flattery, where we have ulterior motives to to fluff somebody up, then it's sin. And it needs to be repented of. Just as much as the person caught up in idolatry or sexual immorality or addiction. Yeah, but that kind of levels it out a little more, doesn't it? If we're not careful, the thoughts turn to actions. Because what's the truth? Is there going to be people of every tongue, tribe, nation in the kingdom of God? Yes. Yes, you know that and I know that. We just went through the whole book of Revelation. The whole thing, verse by verse, took us eight months. And we learned and we know from Revelation 7, 9, that standing before the throne, there's going to be a great multitude of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues wearing white robes. And get this, when John the Revelator asked basically, who are they? You know who those people are? Those are people that just showed up in Christ through the tribulation itself. Not even through the years of humanity before the rapture and the tribulation. That's just during the tribulation. Guys, I want you to think about that. 
that we're called to reach the lost. And that means that we're going to reach people who are different than us. So many ways. And that we can't discriminate against a certain group or a certain type of people. We can't shun somebody away because they don't act like us, dress like us. We can't turn the people away that, that seem less than us. We can't turn the people away that sin different than us. There's people who come in this church that, that are struggling with their, with their sexual identity. There's going to be coming, people in this church that come and they're struggling with their, with their gender. There's going to be people coming come in this church and they're struggling with addiction. They're going to be coming off and they're going to be looking for hope. And so many times how you and I treat them will make all the difference as to whether they stay long enough to hear the gospel, to be convict, convicted and led to a heart of repentance to be redeemed by Jesus. Think about that. How dare you or I judge somebody at the door where they felt like they are not belonged here and they run back to the world because that's where they're accepted and nobody turns them away. Verse 2 through 4 gets more specific in the partiality. It says, for there should come into your assembly, into your meeting place. And this word assembly means, points to the synagogue. Again, pointing to how James is speaking to the, the, the church where it's mostly made up of Jews at the time with very few Gentiles, still pointing to their assembly. If he comes in with gold rings and fine apparel, and then there comes in with a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one with fine clothes and say to the one with the dirty clothes, you go over there, basically sit on the floor. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? When you look at this word here for, in the Greek, that says this man comes in with, with a gold ring on his finger with gold rings. It could literally be translated with the Greek word that's Mr. Goldfinger. It's a man with not just one gold ring, but many gold rings. Back in that time, in the context so we get the full picture of this, this showed that a man was rich. In a Roman society, the wealthy wore rings on their left hand in great abundance. Not just one, but many, even multiple rings on a finger. And that's where you get Mr. Goldfinger. Because it wasn't just one, that bad boy was loaded at every knuckle. And it was war as a sign of wealth and it was war, get this, with great pride and arrogance to show status and that I'm better than somebody. There were even shops in Rome where rings could be rented for special occasions. So even if you weren't, you could look like you were. You know what I'm saying? Boy, how do we fall for that today so many times to appear to the culture, what we're not in reality. So that was the context of this, a ring on every knuckle. Man, so many times we get caught up in the same thing today in churches. And it's not with just rings and multiple rings on a hand, but it's with what we drive the church or how we dress. And dress becomes a, a competition or a fashion show at many churches today. And please don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with dressing up as we should and wear our best to church. But there is, in the same context, nothing wrong with those who don't have what others have. All right? So, we know there was a distinction being made here, where there was an attention being focused on superficiality and appearance. It was a, a story of a, a lady who had gone to church with her husband and on the way home, she had looked over at her husband on the drive home. Is like, did you did you notice the dress that so and so had on the day? It was just so pretty. And did you notice the dress that the so and so had on? I couldn't believe she wore that. And he was like, no. He's like, well, did you did you notice the nice suit that that uh, big five piece suit that so and so had on and those shoes and they were so shiny? Did you notice that? And he's like, no. Nah. Say, well, well, did you notice the hat that so-and-so had on? Wasn't it beautiful? I mean, it was just so fancy. Did you see the purse she had? You know how much that cost? Did you see that? He said, no. And she said, what good does it go for you to do for you to go to church anyway? You don't pay attention to get anything out of it. 
Guys, so many times we have the wrong focus in coming to church. It's about Jesus and his word. And it's never about a show. And it's never about status. If you look at this word here for poor in the Greek, where it says in a poor one, poor man comes in in the Greek, it means extremely poor down to the point of being a beggar. And it says they have a dirty clothes, which is vile raiment. So it's clothes that are filthy, they're dirty, as we would expect maybe a beggar to have on, but then also maybe somebody who was a, a working man. And somebody, you ever think about that? Somebody who had just come to, at the last minute because they got off work and they had to come to church. How dare somebody would be turned away because of the clothes they wear into a congregation? But I'm going to tell you, there's many, 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 many churches today that would look down upon somebody dressed a certain way and wouldn't let them into their church. And it's not right. Why? Because it's not the outward appearance that matters. It's the what? It's the heart. We're looking at a person, a soul for which Jesus died. How dare we turn them away because of a garment? Or because of a status? Because of a fill in the blank? So if we say to one, come and get a good spot, you say to another, sit over there on the floor. We give one a attention because of their fine outward appearance and shun away or ignore and don't talk to or welcome the one that's different than us because they don't measure up outwardly to our standards for whatever reason. Then we've sinned. We've done a great harm to the cause of Christ. And we've inwardly scarred and hurt a person that may be beyond repair because they will associate the love of Christ and their value in Christ by the behavior by which you and I have treated them. There's the conviction message. There's the message of change, of breaking down the walls that society wants to put up, that the enemy wants us to hold up within the church and run people away. Verse 4 in the passage gets a little more direct. It says, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and you've become judges with evil thoughts? Well, you might not think of it that way. Well, I did not mean to judge a person. and I definitely didn't have evil thoughts in my head, but James says you actually do. That you and I actually do if we let this take over and show outwardly. This word for partial in the, in the Greek is the word for distinctions or categories or more pointedly discrimination. So it's where we get our second point where we can pick up our sledgehammer to tear down the walls. And it's no acts of discrimination are to be present in the church. No acts of discrimination are to be present within the church. That means there's, there's got to be no stereotypes. There's got to be no division whatsoever that would even lead us to an act of discrimination. If you look at Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For there is no partiality with God, plain and simple. And I could point to you three or four, maybe more other verses in Scripture that say the exact same thing. There's no partiality with God. There's no partiality with God. God is not a respecter of persons. There's no partiality with God. But if we're not careful, there is partiality with man. And if we let that control and take over, then that partiality will reside within the church. And that's where we've taken over as judge and have thoughts of evil in our head that James points to. So the favor of the rich man over the poor man, in the way James is describing it here, is pointing to something deeper than just the status of one versus the other. It's pointing to a deep carnality among Christians, if we're not careful. What James is pointing at here and getting to is a deep carnality among Christians. Christians in the church, where their evil thoughts are evident by their partial actions. So to show partiality shows that we care more about outward appearance than we do upon somebody's heart and really whether they come to know Jesus or not. Did you ever think about it that way? 
If we show partiality, that means I care more about a person and their appearance than I care about their soul and whether they really meet Jesus or not. That's what that says, and that's, an, of course, an evil thought. What it shows is a heart of people that value riches. And why would we do that? Why would you and I be tempted to do that? Because of society, status, the value it places upon wealth in our society. But then even more so, when you think about it on an ulterior motive point, we believe the rich man can do more for, for us and give us more favors than a poor man can. So it becomes back to selfishness and pride. Do you see that? And it points back to the heart. The actions always point back to the heart. The actions always point back to the heart. And that's what God wants to get at, is our heart. If you are, were with us at the beginning, we stated how James mirrored his teaching after the Sermon on the Mount. So we know that in so many ways, when we just got to the core of what James is trying to say here and pointing to these evil thoughts, he's pointing to what was taught by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. That basically we're to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven and not have treasures on this earth. And he would say later in chapter 6 that a man cannot serve both God and money. What's, what was Jesus teaching at and trying to get at? The heart that we can't, it's, it, not having money is not wrong. It's not. It's the love of money that can lead us down the wrong path. And that's what James is trying to get at here. When we value a person by their status in our own heart, we're valuing the riches and the money more than Jesus. The ground is level at the cross. That's the beautiful part. It's level at the foot of the cross. There is no status at the foot of the cross. And there should not be, therefore, any status within inside the church. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't seniority within the church. There is. There is seniority within the church. The Bible speaks so many times of those who are, are strong in the faith or have spent much time in Scripture and doctrine. It can be a spiritual mentor of, of sorts to those coming underneath it. We see Paul mentoring Timothy. There is seniority in the church and value in seniority. There is still authority in the church. God has given that authority and placed that if you look in Timothy and you look in Titus and there's specifications to the, the authority in the church and what that should look like because authority needs to take place in the church so that, that sound doctrine is teached, so that sin is dealt with within the body and as such. So there is seniority, there is authority, but guys, there is no superiority. So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. Within the church, there is seniority. There is authority, but there is no superiority. Nobody is better than another. Guys, when you point that back, and again, I, so many times I go back to analogies of sports, and I'm sorry for doing that if you don't like sports, but it's a perfect example. On a football team, there's different positions, but none of them are more important than another. The lineman is just as important as the quarterback and the running back and the receiver. Why? Why? Because they each have a job to do. And guys, if there's conflict within that group and the lineman says, well, I'm tired of being a lineman because I don't feel important. I'm going to try to play quarterback. Then there's a spot left on the line for nobody to fill and the enemy comes through and messes up the play. Guys, the same is true within the church. If we get caught up in positions on the team and we don't feel important in our position and we try to play somebody else's position or we long for somebody else's position, then we leave a gap in the line that lets the enemy in for a job that needs to be done that's not getting done that God created you to do and the whole place gets jacked up. That's why God said there's no superiority but I've called each of you to something different. Some of you ha have been given gifts to serve in different capacities and a love for kids and kids ministry or a, or a, a, a love for, for greeting people and your outward. Some of you have been blessed with the, the, the gift of finances and, and your part of the body is to give. Guys, James isn't coming down on rich people here. Can I just tell you that? 
Because there's extreme value to those God has blessed with wealth so that they can help financially advance the cause of Christ in this world. He's not coming down on the rich. He's coming down on people who love money and status over Jesus and the cause of Christ. So Jesus set that example so many times for us, didn't he? Where the Bible even says Jesus came to what? To serve, not to be served, and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. That's your Lord. He came and laid down his life for you. And he set that example, even did what? Jesus did what? By showing his servanthood. He washed feet of who? His disciples. Why? Not to show a tolerance or, 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 or anything towards sin as been recently tried to be portrayed on television? No, but as an act of servanthood to the people who were within the body, that one position was no more important than another, and it was an act of humility. And that's the example Jesus set in his word. And let me tell you, the reason Jesus does what he does in his word is, the, is to set the example so that you and I can become what he is. Jesus does what he does to set the example so that you and I can become what he is. Guys, that's the beautiful part of our Lord. He doesn't just want to lavish us with love. He wants to transform us with his love. Did you get that? He wants to transform us with his love. And we all have a different calling, but I'm going to tell you, everybody is somebody when Jesus Christ is Lord. When Jesus Christ is Lord of your heart, everybody you meet and everybody that walks in this door will be somebody to you. And you wouldn't dare treat them different than another person. If Jesus Christ is Lord and reigning in your heart, you will value a person for who they are and where they are. That doesn't mean, and we'll get to that, it doesn't mean we don't stand on truth and preach truth. To stand on truth and preach truth is not hate. It's not hate. It's necessary as a part of love in Jesus. Jesus never, ever backed down on the truth as he displayed his love to others. When he confronted the sinners, yes, he, he come around them, but he always said, go and sin no more. There was always truth with his love and there should always be truth with our love because if we're not careful, we can love somebody straight to hell if we never confront them with the truth. Verse five, position of the poor is given and it leads to our third point. Is this what James is getting at in this? It's not that one person, the poor, is more important than the rich now. He's not going to flip that. He just said don't esteem the poor more important or the rich more important than the poor. So surely he's not going to flip around here and say the poor are more important than the rich. That's not what he's saying. Don't get that message. This is what he's saying. Our third point. God uses the inexperienced and the unimpressive to do the unimaginable and the unbelievable. God uses the inexperienced and the unimpressive to do the unimaginable and the unbelievable. God, oftentimes in his word, does his divine work and accomplishes it through ordinary people. Why? Because then he gets the glory for it. Because it, then it doesn't make sense to mankind how a person of such low status, how a shepherd boy could slay a giant when a whole army of trained warriors were backing down and he raised up a shepherd boy to sling a rock. Do you get that? That's where he uses the overlooked to shame those who society believes should be more esteemed. It all goes back to a heart. And he'll say this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which we'll read in just a second. But God basically through scripture, uses people of low status to do great things. People who the world's overlooked. So he'll take those who are disapproved and he'll make them disciples. He'll take the underdog and make them a wonder dog. He'll take the chastised and he'll make them a champion. He'll take a zero and he'll make them a hero in his story. 
Guys, that's our God. Why does he do that? Because he wants to get the glory. So no flesh gets the glory, but God alone as he uses the hearts that are sold out to him. Another context in this, as James differentiates, is we know that so often that money is a big temptation and and many people won't have money because many people would be tempted to move away from God with money. That money could actually be a great temptation. But can I go ahead and flip it around and just so, again, that James is not bashing people with money, that being poor doesn't automatically mean that you're solid in the faith. And that you're more esteemed and positioned and ready to be used by God. No, it doesn't. Because a poor man could have just as much or more love of money in his heart than a rich man. Why? Because I desire and I lust after things I don't have. And I lust after the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I want to have the American dream within me and I feel so oppressed and I feel so squashed down that I just desire for more and more and more. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, if that's your heart and you're poor, you are not positioned to be used by God because your heart's for money. Just in the same way that money can, can make a, a rich man depend on his money and not on God, the poor, James is saying, are in a position to depend on God because they surely can't depend on their finances. And we've all been there, those of us that you, you have an old vehicle you're trying to keep on the road, you know what I'm saying? If you are rich, I've been there many times, like, man, I wish I could just stroke that $50,000 check, go get me a new ride. But I got to wake up every day and be like, Lord, please let this tank crank. Lord, please let this tank crank. That's a joking way to say that those without are positioned, if their heart's right, to depend more on God than just the finances that they already have. And the danger could be the opposite if we depend on finances and not on God to pull us out of situations and trials and difficulties. So we get back to the heart of what James is saying, and it's not about a person, and it's not about stuff, it's about a heart. Jesus set the example of servanthood. When you think about it and how we treat people is a direct reflection of how we're treating Jesus himself. If you remember on the road to Damascus, remember Paul? And he was on the road to Damascus, and and Jesus confronted him and struck him down with blindness. And you remember that. And what did Jesus say to him? Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Well, he was killing people. He's killing Christians. But Jesus said, why do you persecute me? Guys, how we treat others is a direct reflection of how we're treating Christ himself. And that's where the passage at the beginning that we're going to read in totality here at the very end, Jesus said, even the acts that you do unto the least of these, you've done unto who? Me. Do you see that? How we treat each other and how we treat people is a direct reflection of how we value and treat Christ. And that's the message James wants to get across. Just remember, we don't esteem people by their appearance. Judas appeared to be much better leadership quality than Peter. He was trusted to handle the money. We saw where that led. Peter was just a fisherman. But Judas must have been, we're not privy to what he did, must have been some kind of businessman or experienced in handling money. So he, he seemed like he was the one more worthy to do such a task. And money had his heart, though, and not the Savior. David was a shepherd boy. John the Baptist, it says, was a man that wore camel hair and a leather belt and ate locusts and wild honey. John the Baptist looked like Sasquatch in the desert baptizing people. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And God used him in so many ways because his heart was right and he pointed to Jesus. It's not about our appearance whatsoever. God's chosen the lowly to be raised up for his glory. And it's the lowly of heart. It's not always the lowly of status because God doesn't look at the status. He looks at the heart. Because we know God used many, many, many a rich person as well. But let's read this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. And Paul, talking to the church at Corinth, says this, it says, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, 
Not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the things and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Here's the key, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's what it's all about. He didn't say that not any wise, not any mighty, not any noble are called. He said not many. Guys, I'm going to tell you we're saved by an M. (laughs) Not many, not any, not any. No, not many. Because God is looking at the heart. We know many people in Scripture that God used who had extreme wealth. Abraham, we don't have time to go through it all, would probably be classified as a billionaire today. And he was the father of many nations who God used to bring forth his son. His sons after him, Isaac and Jacob, were known to be wealthy. Solomon asked for wisdom, and God supplied him with wealth. Guys, I'm going to tell you, having money is not a sin. It's the love of money that's the sin. God can use many people in many ways, and he's gifted us all differently. Look at Job, very wealthy. But though Job had extreme wealth, God knew his what? His heart. And so he even recommended to the enemy who was searching for somebody, have you considered my brother Job? What did God know? That when Satan took his wealth, when Satan took all his earthly possessions, that it wasn't going to affect Job's heart. It would affect Job the man. He was broken, as you and I would be. But it never affected his heart for the Lord. That's the key. It's the heart. James closes the passage with some things that really bring it to a close. And it says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, verse 9, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. What's James pointing to there? You can't just pick and choose what you want to obey. You can't just pick and choose and and display and and try to value your righteousness over somebody else's by how they sin versus how you sin because this is what james knew james knew that somebody would say oh well i treat that rich person that way i gave him that good seat and valued him because uh because love your neighbor as yourself right i'm just loving on him but james knew god knows the heart and god knows the motives which leads to our fourth point God knows the heart and motives of why you do what you do. God knows the heart and the motives of why you do what you do. He knows the reason that's in your heart of why you esteem somebody of status and why you don't talk to somebody of lower status. And you can use the excuse, oh, well, I didn't see them or I didn't pass them. Or, but God knows the heart and what really happened and if that was the truth or not. So the whole problem is this idea of partiality and selective obedience as well. Because where are we going to be judged? James says, we're all going to be judged, what? Under the law of liberty. That's the beautiful part. Remember, we were given that phrase in chapter 1, the the law of liberty. This law of freedom, it has freedom in it. Yes, it does. But it's still a law that must be obeyed and by which we will be judged. Yes, even those within the body of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul told the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, but it's also called the law of liberty because of this. Because it's freely and willingly kept by those who are regenerated and redeemed. And it's no burden or bondage to them. Did you ever think about it that way? This is the law of liberty because it's not burdensome or cumbersome if Christ is in your heart. Remember, like last week, it's sweet like honey, baby. I want to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. That's Jesus in you that does that and gives you that heart. So, James pointing out that, and then at the very end, as we look to close, I don't even know where we're at on time. Having so much fun up here, we're right, we got to close, all right. A good thing we about to is our fifth point that James closes with in this passage. 
It's for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does that mean? Our point number five, value mercy over judgment with one another. Value mercy over judgment with one another. That when we take on these acts of partiality, these acts of prejudice, these acts of discrimination, we have in turn become the judge of a person, have evil thoughts within ourselves, and have become the judge of their heart. Can I tell you that you don't want to be there? Because going back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2 said, for with, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And guys, there's a long message on judging and don't judge me because that's a common thing said in our society and it's taken way, way, way out of context because we actually are, according to Paul, be the, to be the judge of those within the body of Christ, that we are to be fruit inspectors. Nothing wrong with that. We just have to get the plank out of our own eye first so we can help the brother with their speck in theirs, okay? But we are not to judge those outside the church. And again, judgment is not standing on truth because standing on truth is love because love without truth leads to hell. It does. Love without truth lead somebody straight to hell. Truth spoken in love, yes, steps on somebody's toes, confronts them in a lifestyle that's contrary to the word of God, but the whole point is not about their do's and don'ts, the things that they're doing, the things that they're not doing. The whole part is to grab their heart so that they can have a repentant heart to turn to God and be redeemed by his sacrifice on that cross. So even up here on Sundays, I'm not the judge, and I don't want to be the judge. But I am a truth dealer. That's what God's called me to do. So I'm going to speak some truth. And if you see me out, and I've seen it so many times, somebody listening to something, or somebody got something on the table, the rest of them are like, oh, quick, here comes Brad. (laughs) I ain't your judge, and I ain't going to look at you or treat you any different. I'm just going to present truth. And then what you do with that truth is between you and Jesus. And it's about your heart. So I'm not the judge and nor should you be. A truth dealer, I'm a light giver. Here's the truth. I once was blind myself, but now I see. So I really just want to tell you about the change that Jesus made in my heart and life and the new desire and the new life that I long to live. And I mess up still every day, but inside of me is not a desire to make excuses for that mess up, but to live and be differently. And that's what I want to portray to you. And that's what God wants to portray to you through his word is that essentially we're just one beggar trying to tell another beggar where you found some bread. That's what it's about. We're no better than anybody else. I close with a story of Mahatma Gandhi, the great leader of India and believer in Hinduism. And it's said that he had once in a young age searched for truth and he searched for what he could use to change his own life, but change the life of others and breed hope into somebody. And he searched many different religions. And he, when he looked at the Bible and he looked at Christianity and he saw who Jesus was, he was like, man, I think that's it. I got to go learn more about that. And he went to a Christian church in Calcutta. And upon walking into the entrance of the church sanctuary, he was stopped at the door by the ushers. And he was told that he was not welcome and he was not permitted to attend because this church was for high case Indians and white Europeans only. And he wasn't a high case Indian or a white European. So he turned his back and left. And more than turning his back on a building, he turned his back mostly on the authority alone of Christianity. Never again to consider wholeheartedly giving way to Christianity. So the sin of segregation practiced by a church pushed away a man, a prominent leader of India, 
that could have been a champion for the cause of Christ and led millions of people to authentic faith in Jesus, but instead was turned away and shunned and accepted into the world and false religion of Hinduism where he's led many people astray. Where he even later himself declared, I'd be a Christian if it were not for Christians. Guys, how are we treating people? I don't know about you, but I long to be a pastor where everybody's important, where everybody is needed and wanted and sought after, whether you're struggling sin or whether you've been victorious over sin, whether you're a white collar worker or a blue collar worker, you're all welcome. Whether you're educated or you're uneducated, you're welcome. Where we welcome the people in the suites and the people from the streets. And they're all welcome in God's house. Where we don't just look at one another on the outside, but we value what's inside. And there's a soul that was died for by Jesus himself. And how dare we run them away because of the way we look or way they look. Friends, don't you want to be a part of a church like that? Where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That's it. That's it. I'm going to tell you right now, if and when that happens, there's something righteously contagious about that that people just want to be a part of. And I'm going to tell you inside that, that the enemy shakes in his boots with. Because he knows that he knows that he knows that nobody upon nobody upon nobody that walks through this door will ever be turned away. And they will be brought to the truth and the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Where maybe, just maybe, their heart will be brought to repentance. And they will be redeemed by the Son of God. And they will be transformed into a new life. And they will join with this body of church and these warriors that are piercing the darkness with the light of Jesus as the ark on the door is closing so quickly. That's what it's about. <laughs> Grab a sledgehammer and let's tear down the walls. Close our eyes. Bow our head. And I just wonder, I just wonder, I just wonder, Lord, is there anybody here who needs Jesus? If you're here today and you've never surrendered repented and given your life to him would you do that right now before you leave this place don't wait another day just come running to the cross right now and give him your life i wonder if there's somebody in here that might say brad i've surrendered my life previously to jesus and there was a time where i walked with him but lately i've drifted away I've been led astray, and things have been tough. Life's been tough, and I've, I've given in to some things, and I want to come running back to Jesus today. Like the prodigal son, I want to come running back to the cross. If that's you, I want you to do business with Jesus here today as well and rededicate your life. So if you're here and you want to surrender your life to him for the first time or you want to rededicate your life to him, I want to lead you through a prayer that I want you to Speak boldly from the heart and do business with him. And just know that it's not the words alone that save you. It's with the heart that you believe and are justified. And then it's with the mouth that you confess and are saved. Would you confess him as Lord today? Will you entrust your heart, your life, your everything to Jesus right now for the first time or to rededicate? Just say, dear Lord, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I messed up and I'm in need of you, my Savior. And Lord, I'm tired of doing life on my own and I'm running to that cross right now. Lord, save me. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing yourself on that cross, for paying the penalty and the debt that I couldn't pay. And you paid it all. And that through your sacrifice, I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I'm restored. I'm renewed. I'm to be a new person in Christ. I'm to be transformed by the renewing of my mind through your word. And Lord, I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to walk in newness of life. Thank you for raising from the grave three days later, proving that you are God, God in the flesh, and that you stand in victory right now over all hell, death in the grave. And Lord, I want to walk in that same victory right now. And Lord, I commit all of me to all of you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. 
Amen. If that's you and you did business with Jesus right here today for the first time or you rededicated your life to him boldly, unashamed right now, no one looking around, would you raise your hand and say, Brad, I did business with Jesus. I need you and I want you to pray for me right now. Let me see your hand if that's you. First time or rededication. Amen. We're going to close our service like we do every week, just offering you an opportunity to put action with your feet to what God's doing in your heart right now. So let's stand to our feet. Let's sing with all our heart. Let's sing with all our voice. And let's come right now as the Lord leads. Maybe you made a decision for Jesus right there. Maybe, maybe just maybe you need to pray with a pastor up here. There's something going on in your life with a relationship, a financial situation, a health situation, whatever it is. Maybe you need to pray over a lost loved one. Maybe you need to pray over joining the church, whatever the Lord leads right now, whatever the Lord's doing in your heart. Let's just come right now as we sing. Thank you so much for joining us this week in worship at Impact. We trust and know that God's doing an amazing work in your life and in your heart through his word because he is faithful. Hey, if you made a decision for Christ here today, would you let us know? I'd encourage you to go to our website, www.impactforest.org. There you'll find out how you can contact us and let us know what God's doing in your life. There you'll also find out more about what God's doing through this church to impact lives and also find ways that you can give to financially support this ministry as the Lord leads. We hope that you can join us here each and every week online if you cannot attend the service in person. And we would encourage you to lock arms with us in this mission that God has placed us on to make an impact for Christ. We'll see you next Sunday.